I'm going to talk a little bit. What I'm really interested in and what I do a lot of is trying to help those of us who do ethics consultation do it as well as we possibly can. And I'm also very interested in improving my own practice all the time by surrounding myself with colleagues who challenge me and ask me to do better all the time. Um, so thankfully, I have a lot of them here. And um, they're great colleagues. And so it's in this vein that I want to talk to you today. Um, what I want to do is identify how ethics consultants negotiate insider and outsider status, particularly related to patients and family members, and then colleagues within our healthcare institution, namely the clinicians caring for those patients. I'd like to discuss strategies for maintaining fairness and integrity while negotiating this insider and outsider status. To me, even though the core competencies and other guiding um, texts and uh, guidelines don't talk a ton about the importance of fairness and integrity, this is essentially what guides me and the people I work with whom I admire. I often notice that this is what guides them, and they're the people that I look up to, are the people who let these two principles guide them. So just to give us all a little bit of groundwork, um, the core competencies, the revised core competencies, have not really changed what the goal of healthcare ethics consultation is. But what we do try to do is to improve the quality of healthcare through the identification analysis and resolution of ethical questions or concerns. I should mention here, I'm just probably articulating what all of you also believe, but I consider ethics consultation always in every single case to be a partnership. My, um, the percentage of my uh, involvement in helping to resolve difficult cases is probably about 15%. The majority of the resolution of the case is coming from all the other people involved. Um, and by pooling expertise, by respecting expertise and various points of view, I find we can sometimes help. Not always, but sometimes. Um, and so because of that, I think the idea that uh, ethics consultants should focus on facilitation and occasionally mediation is about right. Because if you're a facilitator, what you're doing is you're allowing the best of everybody around you to come to the fore and to greatly influence the quality of care that's happening for the patient. The secondary goal underneath this is to, is to help to promote practices consistent with ethical norms and standards, of course. And those are ethical norms and standards. They often comport with legal norms. We must always be aware of the legal norms, but they're not always the same thing. Identifying the causes of ethical concerns and assisting individuals and the institution in handling current and future ethical problems by providing education and healthcare ethics. So, as you know, while all healthcare providers, ethics is a part of what they do. So, there's already a high bar in terms of ethics in the, in the context in which we work. People who take care of sick people and healthy people to keep them healthy already are, have a moral um, engagement with society that's different than many other professions. But we do something that often not a lot of other people in the institution have the expertise to do. Whereas people try to be ethical, I would argue we're all trying to be ethical and moral and kind and considerate, not everybody has the skill set to help facilitate these kinds of conflicts. Not everybody has the skill set and the knowledge base to help people understand the ethical conflict and to give them some tools to think through it so that they've really been able to see the picture as clearly as possible to make the best decision for them. So in this way, we're a little bit of an outsider. But we always are an insider insofar as we work for the hospital in some way or in some cases are consulted by the hospital. So the goals of the ethics consultant, as distinct from the consul, um, consultation itself, to me are to promote and ensure fairness, to promote and ensure the integrity of the process, and of course to act with and maintain integrity ourselves. 
So to me, I often talk about, and this is in the literature a little bit, um, I don't think of us as advocates for one person or another person because it depends on the consultation you find yourself in, where you need to put your insider and outsider status to balance things out a little bit and to make sure things are fair. So I don't think we ever advocate for a particular party, but I do think we are advocates for a fair process that gives people as much of a voice as possible and respects the values that they bring to bear to this very important issue that we're facing together. Both of these things, integrity and fairness, require negotiating insider and outsider status. Um, and the first way we do this, I think, is by being an insider with the person that we're talking to. So in my particular practice, I know there are many ways of doing ethics consultation. In my practice, I try to talk to people one-on-one -on -one first. That allows me to try to understand the story from their point of view first without having to do the secondary turn that we also must do, which is to scrutinize and challenge one another and the positions that we've brought to bear. But starting with that insider status allows me to um, build trust, but I don't want to then betray it by um, using my outsider status inappropriately. In other words, um, by um, uh, using whatever power or influence I have within the institution to pr bring about a particular course of action because I personally think that course of action is the best one. So just, this is just by way, um, gives me an opportunity to have a touchstone to illustrate some of the ideas I'll be talking about. This is a case written by a professor of mine, Mark Blyton, who's also an ethics consultant currently. And um, so, and this is about the early days of maternal fetal surgery. I and Micah and some others here were trained at Vanderbilt. And um, at the time, in the mid 90s when we were there, Vanderbilt was doing maternal fetal surgery for fetal myelomeningocele's. And Rebecca, who was a woman in her, I believe, her 20s, came to Vanderbilt after discovering at 18 weeks, a gestational age, that her fetus had spina bifida. She had decided before arriving that she would not terminate the pregnancy and wanted the surgery. This is quite common, not unique to maternal fetal surgery, but the idea that people had done some research beforehand, they had already chosen not to terminate the pregnancy based on um, the diagnosis of the fetus, and they were coming for a specific thing. They wanted the surgery. So she was meeting with the clinicians and the ethics consultant as a part of the routine evaluation. Ethics was enlisted to be a routine part of that evaluation given the riskiness of this surgery. There are chances of both um, maternal consequences, uh, uterine dehistate, um, and as well as thinning of the uterine, um, the area where the incision is happening, preterm labor, um, and uh, other pulmonary problems are also associated with this. Um, so this, this was a concern both for fetal well-being as well as for maternal well-being. Um, the ethics consultant role consultant's role in this case was to discuss her perspective, expectations, and values regarding awaiting birth to address the baby's spina bifida, which is the routine practice at this point, or undergoing this maternal fetal surgery, taking on the risk of losing her pregnancy altogether, um, or having a premature baby, for example, um, and, and to talk about her values in this. So in addition to the grief, uncertainty, and apprehension that Rebecca was feeling, she was also feeling guilty because she had been taking a medication during pregnancy that in, had increased her risk of uh, fetal spina bifida. She was offered and opted for surgery, and her 23-week-old fetus died one day post-op. At this point, the, what, what Mark cites at the time, there's more research that's been done since then, of course, is uh, the risks of surgery included fetal demise at 5%, preterm labor was at 12%. Now, for example, there are some data that suggest that um, 
The uh, death within the first year is diminished sometimes uh, post-surgery. Uh, the need for uh, the development of hydrocephaly and the need for shunts can be diminished somewhat. Um, and there are a couple of other positives, but as with, with most technologically complex things, we can talk a lot about the positives and we can talk a lot about the negatives and the negatives are pretty compelling. Um, and the positives are too, but the negatives have to be taken into consideration. And certainly as an ethics consultant, you don't want to be so enthusiastic about what your colleagues are going to be undertaking that you're tipping completely over as an insider with all the clinicians, right? Your job is to negotiate between the cautiousness of, uh, that may not always be expressed in discussions with the clinicians who, who might be uh, trained in advocating for this position. And you're negotiating that with some skepticism. You want some skepticism, and then you also want to have some enthusiasm. So it seems to me you can't be, even in this, you're sort of doing this. I think of this as sit, standing on a raft. If, you're, if the, um, everybody involved in an ethics consultation is on the raft, you've got to, and you're standing there too, because now it's an ethics consultation. So it's filled with cl clinicians who are caring for the patient, as well as the patient and her loved ones and her family. Um, sometimes, and usually by the time they've called us, there's a tiff or two, sometimes an outright fist fight, but sometimes just a tiff. So things are a little rocky on the raft. And what we're trying to do in the interest of fairness is just to keep the raft steady. Sometimes that means leaning a little toward the side of the patient and the surrogate in order to make sure the clinicians have as clear and fair an understanding of the perspective of the patient and surrogates as possible. Other times, it means leaning a little bit toward the clinicians to help to ensure that the patient and surrogate have a really clear understanding of the clinical picture and the obligations that those clinicians face. Um, and so when we talk about fairness, there are lots of ways to think about it, but um, we think of it as equitableness, honesty, impartiality, uprightness, according to the OED. But more descriptively, justice as fairness is the equitable and appropriate treatment in light of what is due or owed persons. So the holder of a justice claim has a right to and is due something. So as a person who is trying to be committed to fairness and justice in the context of ethics consultation, um, the question then becomes, what do I owe, right? Uh, what is due to the people whom I am engaging with in the context of an ethics consultation? Now, strangely, the fair opportunity rule seems relevant to me when I do ethics consultations. Of course, this is Rawls and Norm Daniels, and they're not talking about ethics consultation. They're talking about macro, social policy, and allocation. But there's something that's compelling about this. No person should receive social benefits on the basis of undeserved, advantageous properties because no person is responsible for these properties. And likewise, no person should be denied social benefits on the basis of undeserved, disadvantageous properties for the exact same reason, because they're not responsible for those properties either. And so here we're talking about the natural lottery, whether you were sick, this this fetus, it's going to be born with spina bifida, whether you are ill, that's not your fault, or whether social circumstances diminished opportunities or perhaps made you or your family an object of discrimination and, dis and other forms of oppression. Um, those I feel like you have to pay attention to very carefully within ethics consultation because um, they be, can become so invisible unless somebody raises them. So how does this fair opportunity rule apply to healthcare ethics consultants? It seems to me one of our primary obligations is to attend to disparities in power and authority and the differentials that come because of that. Because of this, um, it means that we cannot align ourselves too closely 
with the institution. So when the, think of it from the perspective of the patient and the family. All of these people who know a whole bunch of stuff and have expertise to bear and a lot of power are telling them what they think they should do for, in this case, Rebecca and her fetus. Or they're giving her some options. In this case, it's so elective. They're laying out some options. And we, everybody has to play by our, our rules. Talcott Parsons talks about certain institutions require you to lose a little bit of your, your identity in order to, to get what you need. And hospitals are one of them, so are prisons. But the idea is a lot of your identity is stripped a little bit when you come under these in, into these kinds of situations. And so that means when people step into it as patient or family member, the, this, the, um, the deck is stacked against them a little bit to begin with. This is not to say that they are in and of themselves oppressed, right? Occasionally they might be. We need to pay attention to that. I'm simply saying that we have a lot of power. And if I come in as the ethics consultant, seeming to be yet another person from that perspective, it can undermine my ability to build trust and elicit their, um, their faith in me to try to be fair. Because if fa fairness is what we're trying to do. And in some ways, I know everybody's trying to be fair in our work. But in some ways, there's something, when they call us, often they're calling us right before or soon before they might be enlisting the courts if they can't figure out a resolution. So our, our standards for fairness, I think, are even higher. And we also want to level the playing field and ensure that the strongest or loudest voice doesn't prevail just because they're strongest or loudest. And in the case like this, um, often in surgical sort of cultures, subcultures within, within medicine, it is the norm that the people defer to the surgeon. Now, there's very good reason to do this in many contexts. But in the context we're dealing with here, we have to pay attention to that to ensure that there isn't so much of that or too much of it. And that means standing up a little bit to that notion that the final authority is, well, let me put this differently. The final decision-making authority is always the patient and surrogate and the attending physician. We never challenge that. That's not the issue. But the idea is to, sometimes we do need to stand up a little bit and voice things that other people may be uncomfortable voicing to people in power. I think that's part of what we have to be willing to do. And that also means, I'm using the surgical example as an example, sometimes that also means the patient and family, who usually family members, who are intimidating people. It's the same kind of thing, right? They're intimidating healthcare providers. We also need to be able to stand up to them. So what are those involved in ethics consultation owed? I think they're owed a respectful hearing of their values and perspectives. They're owed um, never to be excluded from the process or from conflict resolution. They're owed the opportunity to have their expertise and legitimate authority in decision making respected. That means both le the legitimate medical and clinical expertise of caregivers and the legitimate expertise and knowledge of, let's say, the patient's values and what their goals are, et cetera. These have to be presented on an even playing field. I think they're owed um, the opportunity to, to be partners in defining potential solutions, to be educated about the ethical issues in the case, to be enlisted in reasonable attempts to carve compromise, and to clarify ethical norms that are less negotiable. For example, the idea that Rebecca, as a decisional, competent, pregnant woman, gets to have the final say. I usually don't have to go over that in an ethics consultation, but if someone in the consultation was clearly not getting that point, it would be my obligation to make sure that was clear. That's sort of not negotiable. So the other thing that becomes important as I'm trying to be fair, as we're all trying to be fair, is that we act with integrity and that the process has integrity. Integrity happens to be something I like a lot. I wrote my dissertation on it. I'm just going to give you a couple different ways we talk about integrity. One is what I'll call, and another author named Ramsey called, a formalist account. This is the idea of principled coherence. It really has mostly to do with coherence. Um, it's the integration of values and commitments within an individual. People live by their values over time. 
right? They're coherent. I can expect what somebody's going to do because that's what they always do. Now, whether this is good or bad doesn't really matter to a formalistic account of integrity, right? To, in this account, um, freedom is expressed through the choice of values and commitments to adopt. So let's say we have somebody who doesn't really like to get into a whole lot of detail when they talk to family members, a clinician, for example. But this is what he always does. Right? This is a part of the integrity that I'm seeing in him when I'm talking to him about the case. And I don't have to make a judgment about it. I don't have to, as an ethics consultant, say, he's pretty bad that he's not such a good communicator. I can just be an insider with him, get in there and figure out what his thinking is. Right? What's going on with him? How does he see this? What's the through line? The example for formalist integrity is, it's like a bridge. So the, the integrity of a bridge it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to look great. It literally just needs to safely get you from one bank of that river to the other bank of the river. Um, Eretic, so, so we can do that in a number of different ways. So every single person, even if in the end I really don't think they're very nice, although that rarely happens, they have some kind of integrity. And my job primarily is to look at it through this formalist lens. What is it? Describe it. How does this person work? What values are at play that make their request for this course of action make sense? And my job is to relay that in a sympathetic way to those who don't understand why they would ever be asking for this. Right? Some of these cases, we can think of some of these cases we've seen today. Eritaic integrity involves this notion of excellence and virtue, and essentially, it's sometimes defined as the uni unity of the virtues. In other words, it's the goal of truly virtuous behavior that I think we all strive toward. But I would argue first you got to figure out who you are first. So Kant would like this a lot. You got to figure who are you? What is freedom for you? What is, you know, where do you begin and end? And then once you figure that out, you can also start to say, now, I want to be trustworthy in these kinds of ways. I want to be more courageous. I want to work on being an even on it, more honest and um, uh, compassionate person, for example. This requires phrenesis, which is the notion of um, practical wisdom. The idea that you know what to do in a given situation. You can explain it. People can trust it, right? We all know these people. We look to them to help us all the time. This is what we're striving for. So tolerance and respect for autonomy re requires attention to formalist notions of integrity, it seems to me. And character development and professional requires attention to eretaic, in my opinion. So in an ethics consultation, it seems to me, we're trying to describe the integrity of each party's position using formalist notions of integrity. How does this behavior or position cohere in light of previous behaviors, values, commitments, and experiences. The example I often give is, it's not unusual to have an ethics consultation. You have frustrated clinicians. They're doing their best, but it's not working. They're doing what they think is best, and it's not working. Um, and there's a la lack of harmony. And I'll sometimes hear, the family is being unreasonable, right? They are unrealistic, and they're unreasonable. And I sit there and I go, I bet they are, especially from your perspective. From what you've described, they really are. And I genuinely feel that way. In this respect, I'm an insider with them. I genu genuinely believe them. I believe people are telling me the truth. But when you go and talk to the family, it's completely coherent, utterly and completely coherent, right? But the whole storyline looks different. And my job is to make sure the family understands the coherence of the clinician's story and that the clinicians understand the coherence of the family's story so that we can minimize whose side everybody's on and uh, facilitate resolution of conflict. So in my mind, what I do is I apply, I apply high erotic standards to my own behavior. I am always trying to be a better person. No matter how good I am today, I'm trying to be a better person tomorrow. I'm trying to do the consult better the next time. And I'm going to keep trying to do that because that's who I think I should be, and that's who I think. The best ethics consultants and the best clinicians and the best friends and the best parents, this is what they do, right? They try to be better. But what I want to do with colleagues is I want to apply reasonable erotic standards to healthcare providers. 
They don't have to be the highest, they just have to be reasonable because there are virtues and particular kinds of orientations to patients and obligations that far exceed just regular citizen obligations among healthcare providers, and I believe they're erotaic, but I, they need to be reasonable standards. And then I allow those erotaic standards to help determine reasonable norms in the particular ethics consultation. In other words, we do want to be virtuous. We just don't want to railroad anyone in the name of one person's virtue over, over and against somebody else's notion of virtue. So again, let me go back to the RAF. These last two slides are just examples of ways I can, one could see yourself as an outsider or insider vis-a-vis -vis the healthcare provider. And then the second slide are ways in which you can see yourself as an outsider or insider vis-a-vis -vis the patient and the surrogate. I'm sure you can think of many more examples. But again, if I think of this as a raft, I'm sort of straddling these two sides. And sometimes, in mo moments in the consultation, I gotta lean a little this way and listen carefully. And then other times I've gotta lean a little this way and listen carefully. And then what I need to do is not get off the raft. <laughs> so that when it capsizes, well, no, it doesn't, <laughs> no, I shouldn't say, <laughs> I shouldn't say when it capsizes. Occasionally in all of our experiences, it has capsized. I'm still there with everybody. Whether we get to the shore that we wanted to get to, or whether it capsizes and we're all flailing for our life jackets. Um, and so I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stop there. Um, I'll let you see a little bit of how I see of us as insiders and outsiders from the patient and family perspective. And I wanna thank you for my to your time. And I don't think we have time. It looks, I can't tell exactly. Okay, I'd be happy to take a brief, succinct, one or two comments or questions. Hi. Um, could you speak a little bit about your documentation of, I, I, it's on the practical side of things, I feel that, yeah, I get that, but, um, I've taken very different approaches and have been advised early on in my few ethics consultations I've done to take different approaches in what I put in the charts. Could you talk a little bit about how you approach that? I would be glad to, but you gotta give me an example. Um, what were you advised? Okay, well, for instance, on the most recent two, and John corrected me if I'm wrong, because I have John Lantos very close to help me out and, and others, but uh, um, in, and it kind of depended on the questions we were asked or the reasons we were consulted, but. The last one was to look into a, a case in the NICU um, where um, the father's incarcerated, the mother has uh, des expressed desire to relinquish rights in a very complex um, medical situation where the team is now really, really feels that withdrawal of, of uh, ventilator and, or, or at least um, at minimum a do not escalate care order, do not resuscitate order should be on the chart and the legal status isn't completely understood yet, and so um, advised to write things as kind of a letter of support of why we think that is a rational you know, way to go, um, versus um, a more, where I'm coming from as a bone marrow transplant physician, you know, just putting on the ethics hat relatively recently, um, writing from a documentation of all of the medical things that have been done up to this point, and, documenting the questions the family has, that's, my, that's the first way I wanted to write my first ethics consult. These were the questions that were asked by this side. These were the questions asked here. This is what I did to try to reconcile those things and, yeah. and help balance the rap. So I guess I'll answer it this way. Um, sometimes what I say is I'm not ordained, so I don't bless anything. <laughs> um, and so what I would say is that I think it does take some practice, but there are ways in which we do have legal and other kinds of constraints in chart notes. We all have it recently. I know places where you're advised not to mention that you talk to risk management. I think this is ridiculous. I think it's absurd. But nonetheless, okay, if that's the rule, I'm not gonna buck the rule, because again, it would un undermine my insider status, which I really don't wanna have happen generally at the hospital. But the point is, um, the point is, I think there are ways to write it so that you're not, I think sometimes we are implicitly asked to simply endorse one point of view or another. 
And I think you have to, especially when I feel like I'm being asked to do that, I go to more pains to make sure I have, I have fairly described the point of view, <laughs> like especially if I end up agreeing with them, that goes without saying. If I disagree with them, it's a different thing. But if I agree with the point of view that the person who called me had when they called, then I go to pains to make sure I have ad adequately described the point of view that d ends up not prevailing in the most sympathetic light as possible. So this is the practical questions there. Summer, you can come to summer seminar <laughs> to get some of those. We don't do that as much here, but there, I think there are practical strategies for that. Okay, thank you very much.